Well, men, this is really our last lecture, and uh, you guys have been sending in your messages, your videos, and those have been great to watch. I thought we would do something in this last, uh, now there'll be one more video, which will be an inter, or introduction, a review for the final exam. Definitely watch it. It's only about six, seven minutes long, and it'll give you exactly how to prepare for your final. So watch it and then go and study and then come back, take your final the next day or whatever. Um, but definitely the next video will prepare you for your final exam. But what I thought I would do in this last, so to speak, teaching instructional video is take a passage of scripture and walk through this passage uh, the way that I would prepare for a message. Now, I am taking a, a very familiar passage of scripture and we could have taken uh, an obscure one and maybe that's what we should have done. But I, I decided to do this because I think it'll bring out all the points that I want to bring out. So if you would, take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22 is the familiar story of Abraham willing to offer his son Isaac. Now, as you come, let's say you're doing a series on the patriarchs, or you're doing a series through the book of Genesis, or you're doing a series on the, on the life of Abraham. Chapter 22 is going to be a key chapter in Genesis and in whatever. It's an incredible story. It's without a doubt, one of the great pictures of Jesus Christ, the Father and Christ. And obviously, God the Father did not spare his son. He actually took the life of his son as a sacrifice. And this is a picture of that, though Abraham was, was willing and was going to do it, and the Lord held him back from, from killing his own son as a sacrifice. So we're a little bit familiar with the passage. Um, so the first thing that I would do is, if I'm studying this passage and I'm going to speak at a camp, I'm thinking of young people uh, and you know what that entails for them. If I'm speaking to the church um, and I have older saints in there, mature saints, there may be some other areas. You've got to have in front of you the people you're going to preach to. And I'll tell you why. The truths of the Word of God never change. However, what truths each person needs, or every, shall we say, group of people, the target group, whether they're young people, middle-aged, with families, what a great, uh, I preached on this passage of Scripture before for Father's Day. What an incredible Father's Day message Abraham willing to sacrifice his son who he loves above all things. So wh whatever you're going to preach, you, you got to think of who your target. If it's Father's Day, you're going to be thinking along those lines. If it's teenagers, you're going to be thinking along those lines. You say, well, well, well uh, Dr. Scheller, what if it's your church? Well, this is where it gets really interesting. See, I believe that the Word of God is profitable for everything a man needs. Their doctrine, what's right, their reproof, their correction, their instruction in righteousness. So now, I have a congregation that has many needs. There's teenagers in there, there's young couples in there, there's young fathers in there, there's old fathers, there's grandparents, there's singles, there's, you got everything in there. You have male, you have female. That's where you rely on the Holy Spirit to show you what does my church need. Now you say, well, how does this all happen, Brother Scheller? Okay, you first of all pray over the pay. You're in a series in Genesis and you've now come to Genesis 22. It doesn't matter if you're preparing a message for a camp or, or what have you. This would be the first thing you do. Lord, pray over the passage. I'd pray before I read it then I would read the passage three times. During the reading of the passage three times, I would begin to ask questions. And we're going to do that in just a moment here. We're going we're to go through this passage and we're going to write down questions. Then I'm going to go back through the passage and I'm going to pick out words that are extremely important, I feel, to that verse or that, that area of the story right then. I'm going to write down all those words. 
Then I will begin to define all those words. And in defining the words, I'm going to start answering some of the questions. Some of the questions I may ask, I will never get an answer for. Brother Sheldon, I'm not sure I understand. Well, let me tell you something. I have definitely asked questions of passages that I was not able to answer. I will then go to commentaries to see if I can come up with an answer. And a lot of them I find out, hey, you know what? They never answered that question about that text either, you know. And so I'm not saying I answer every question. But the questions begin to guide me on where I'm going to go. And then I begin to formulate an outline. What is this passage saying to the group of people that I'm going to preach to? Now, the passage may be saying something to Jim Shetler. Well, I'll treasure that. I'll cherish that. That'll be a blessing to me. That's all a part of tasting what I'm going to serve. But that may not be. I may edit that out. That was for Shetler. But it may not be for the church or the group of people that I'm going to speak to. So I begin to sort out and become now, I've read it, I've prayed over it, I've asked questions about it, I've defined words, I've gone to commentaries. Where am I being led by the Spirit of God now? Now I've given the Spirit a bunch of things that I know that the Spirit of God can guide me and direct me in the study of that passage. I think we ought to study today and start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for inspiring Genesis 22. This is not man's writings, what we're about to read. This is yours. Lord, <clears throat> though I don't have a specific target group this morning in, the, in going through this passage, guide us in sermon prep methods, techniques, and procedures that you want these men to start developing in their life. So, Lord, may Genesis 22 come alive to us today. May it speak to us in whatever area you want it to speak to. And we pray these things now in Christ's name. Amen. Now, because of time, I'm not going to read the entire passage. However, um, it goes through to verse 19. The story of God testing Abraham is Genesis 22, verse 1 all the way to verse 19. So let's say I have prayed over the passage, I have read it three times, I have prayed again, and asked the Lord to guide me. Now, after I've done all of that, now I'm going to come back to verse number one, and I'm going to begin to, I, I'm going to, begin to ask questions. Listen to this. And it came to pass after these things. Okay, first question. After... What things? All right, so if I'm doing a series, chances are I'm going to review chapters 20 and 21. A lot of things have happened in Abraham's life. Probably the biggest is the situation with Hagar and the child Ishmael has been born, which God does not consider. And we'll we'll get to that in just a minute. We'll, We'll talk about that. But I'm going to probably review when it says, and it came to pass after these things. Well, I want to know, first question I'm going to ask is, what things preceded Genesis 22? What happened in Abraham's life? And I think that's going to be very important. That God did tempt Abraham. Okay, so two things are going to happen right here. One is, I know I'm going to look up the word tempt and get the definition. But the second thing I'm going to ask is, why would God tempt Abraham? And can God tempt somebody? I thought it says somewhere in the book of James, chapter 1, that God tempts no man. But it just says here, God tempt Abraham. So I got some questions about that. What's that going to be all about? Uh, And said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac. All right, I got a question. Isaac's not his only son. Ishmael is also his son. Why does God say, take thy only son, Isaac? Now, that is going to unlock an incredible truth. Now, I know the answer to that question already, but I'm telling you guys, why does God call Isaac his only son when he's got another one, Abraham's only son, Isaac, when he's got another son named Ishmael? The truth to that is incredible. 
Okay, now, I wouldn't have known that, but I'd surely ask that question. What is this being his only son? Whom thou lovest. Well, I'm kind of doing two things at once right now. But, okay, I'm definitely looking up, up that word lovest. And uh, that's kind of interesting because I've been studying now in this Genesis series, and I don't think I've come across that word, and you haven't. This is going to be the first time in the Bible that the word love is mentioned. And I think it's going to be interesting that God's going to ask Abraham to sacrifice that which he loves. You know, and I think you can start coming up with a definition for sacrifice. I don't think, I think you can, I, I don't think it's really a sacrifice to give something up if you don't have an affection for it, if you don't have a love for it. What sacrifice am I giving up by giving my time or this or whatever if I don't care about that? So it's interesting what the Lord says. Whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of Moriah. Where in the world is Moriah? And, and what, is it, what is that land of Moriah? And offer him there for a burnt offering. What is a burnt offering? And when would you use a burnt offering? And as far as I know, the offerings haven't been given yet to, to, to man. That happens in Exodus. We're in Genesis and about the tabernacle. and the, What is a burnt offering and how long have they existed? Upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Whoa. So Moriah must be a mountain range and God's going to show him the very mountain he wants him to be on. By the way, what a great truth that is. You take your step forward and God shows you the next step. He doesn't tell him what mountain at this point. He's going to tell him what mountain later on. I'm going to write that down. That's a great point. God reveals his will one step at a time. He didn't tell Abraham everything. He didn't tell Abraham there was going to be a ram in the thicket. He didn't tell Abraham even what mountain. He said, you just get going. And as you get going, I'll show you the next step. Wow, that'll preach. I write that down. Somehow I'm going to get that into that message. All right. Verse number three. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. I wonder why he rose up early in the morning. Write it down. That's going to be a good one. And saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. I wonder why he took two young men with him. And Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, so they were three days away. Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and, whoa, worship and come again to you. Okay, a bunch of things are going on in my mind right now. Number one, I'm going to define worship here. Number, number two, why did he tell the guys to stay? And why does he go? Number three, um, and they're going to worship. So this sacrifice was a form of worship. You know, I think you can sacrifice without worship, but I don't think you can worship without sacrifice. And um, I'm going to find out a lot about worship on this. I'm going to find out why Abraham separated himself with the two men. I got some questions about this. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. Well, I immediately jot down, hey, that looks like a picture of Christ carrying the cross. Um, or whatever, and I'm going to look into that. And he took the fire in his hand. What is fire a picture of? Why is fire? He's going to start the. He's going to start the, the 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 sacrifice with that and a knife. And they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham. By the way, how old was Isaac right now? Is he a, is he a little kid? Nine years old? Is he in his teens? Is he in his early twenties or early thirties? And Isaac spake. I want to find that out. And because I think that's going to be important. How old is this guy that's going to be the sacrifice? And Isaac spake unto Abraham, <coughs> his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Okay, so Isaac doesn't have a clue about what's going to happen here. Why didn't Abraham tell Isaac anything at this point? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. Whoa. What does provide mean? And what's the, the word there? Um, that God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. 
And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son. Well, did Isaac fight? Did Isaac do what? You know, bound his son. Why did he bind him? And laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. I don't, I, I'm not coming up with any questions, but you guys might be. Verse 11. Write them down. You write the questions down. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. I always kind of wonder, why do you have to say it twice? And he said, here am I. That's the third time in this chapter so far that Abraham said, here am I. I don't know if that has anything, but I'm going to write that down. Third time, here am I is mentioned by Abraham. What meaning does that have? Verse 12. And he said, that would be the Lord. Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. No, he said God's omniscient. God already knows what's going to happen here. Why does God say, now I know? Okay, I got a question with that. That's a huge question to me. How can God be saying, now I know? What does this have to do with? By the way, I'm not going to give you the answer. But you got to look up James chapter 2, that this is recorded in there. Faith without works is dead. Now I know you got faith because you got works to follow your faith. But I'm kind of giving you a clue. But what, what, a, what a message that is. <clears throat> By the way, I'm definitely going to look up the word no. What in the world does that mean? Now I know that thou fearest God. <clears throat> I want to look up the word see and fearest. What does that mean? Fearest God. Seen. I want to know what seen means. Thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. See what that word looked, and if that has any correlation with seen in the previous verse. And behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket. So what is a ram? What, what kind of animal is this? What do we know biblically about this ram? Where are rams mentioned in the Bible? I got a lot of questions about rams right now. Ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Whoa, I want to look up that word instead, that phrase, in the stead of. That's just, because that's what salvation is, vicarious atonement, taking the place of. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. By the way, notice he doesn't call God Jehovah Jireh. He called the place Jehovah Jireh. What does Jehovah Jireh mean? As it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. <clears throat> and the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of the house a second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee. This surrender of the thing that you love the most to God, I will now bless you for your dedication, your surrender, your giving over to God. Okay, so I'm writing down all these questions. I wrote down all these words. I'm going to look these up. I'm going to start defining, uh, defining the words. I think some of my questions are going to be answered then, but if I still have questions, then I'm going to bring out the commentaries. So what is a you know what is Ironside? What does uh, Ironside say on this passage? What does Matthew Henry say? What is the biblical illustrator? Whatever illust whatever uh, commentaries you use, I like Butler on biographical sketch. I'm gonna look up Butler on Abraham. What does he say about this passage? But I have read this. I have prayed over this. I have studied this. I have asked questions. I have defined words. I've allowed the Holy Spirit to God. And by the way, I did this starting in Monday. And every day I'm doing a little bit more. And by Friday, Saturday, if I'm having a long period of time, now I'm looking at these commentaries. I got them all out. I'm, I'm really checking things. I'm answering my questions. And the Holy Spirit all week long has been guiding me and directing me in this passage of Scripture. And I'm going to tell you something, guys. <clears throat> Your points are going to start coming out. Okay, I definitely want to cover this thing about who, what he loved. I definitely want to talk about this thing about tempting, that God tempted Abraham. I want to explain that to my people because they're going to really struggle with that. So I'm kind of writing out the big rocks in the jar. Well, those big rocks are going to end up being the points of my outline. I go over that. 
then, you know, let's see what happens with alliteration. Something's starting to formulate a little bit. I don't have to have alliteration, but if it can help other people remember, I'm looking for that. Sometimes I take a break. I take a nap for a little bit. I come back and allow my mind, while I was taking my nap, sorted everything out. And I wake up and I'm going like, whoa, I got this, man. This is really good. And, and I'm able to put it together. So that is a crash course on sermon prep that I do. I know there would be other pastors and other preachers that would do things differently. But I am going to tell you, this has served me well. And I just haven't jumped at other people's materials, first of all. I allowed the Holy Spirit to work in my life. I asked questions. I target thought constantly the filter of who I'm preaching to is constantly my filter for this passage of Scripture. And, and you know, what does this speak to them? I'm defining words, and as I'm defining words, I'm really understanding the passage. I still may have come to a wall where I don't understand something about it. I still don't understand the thing about tempting. How does this happen? Then I'm looking up some commentaries. Some other men have gone through this same thing. They've got some answers. I, I might have found some things they didn't find. I might make sure I'm not going to be in a heretic. You know what? J. Vernon McGee, Matthew Henry, Harry Ironside all said the, the same thing, the conclusion I came up with. That's, you know, that's pretty safe. Uh, in a multitude of counselors, they're, they're wanted not safety. I, I looked up some counselors, my other, uh, other ones. By the way, once in a great while, I'll call somebody up that I really consider a scholar, <clears throat> someone that's really studied the word, and sometimes I'll, I'll give them a call and say, hey, have you ever studied this passage and what did you come up with with that? Uh, I don't do that a lot, but I definitely have done that. And I found that to be extremely helpful when I have as well. So guys, I hope that's uh, just some good sermon prep for you that will help you uh, down the road. Uh, very practical, just a little bit about what I've done. Um, I will tell you, I have found doing it the way that I have just described has benefited me in my own walk with the Lord in an amazing way. The scriptures have just popped and have come alive by this kind of research. I do believe that the definition of words is the key to understanding a passage. So looking up those words, and I use the theological word book of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, I use Vine's Expository Dictionary. Um, I also have a uh, a Zodiades Bible that has numbers next to many of the words, and it has a Strong's Concordance in the back. I look up those words. I'm just really big on the definition of words to understand that passage. And then once you understand the words, the metaphors, the word pictures, start the illustrations start coming together. Uh, as well. So I hope that's a help to you guys. Uh, your next video is in preparation for the review. So make sure you're ready to go uh, up for your final. Make sure you're ready for that. Guys, I'm excited about how the Lord's going to use you. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the lectures. God bless you.